Amen and amen. We are so thankful for all the work. It uh, has a great uh, symmetry to it. And there are still some projects that are underway. And uh, one of them they completed yesterday, literally. And that was the raising of the sidewalks where they had collapsed out here in front of the foyer and down around the corner. That was all raised up yesterday. And uh, just kind of amazing the technology that's out there. And they're able to shoot uh, that stuff and just bring it up and it stays right there. Hey, hope you'll stay for lunch today. We've already got some of the tables. And after we all move out, we're we're going to move out into the foyer or this hallway. Uh, we've got the deacons that are going to be tearing down these chairs and there will be tables and chairs all in this center part as well. So we uh, hope you'll stay. Listen, you say, well, I didn't make anything. Well, we have Dickie's barbecue for you. So there is uh, brisket. There's a little more brisket than there is of uh, chicken and also uh, pulled pork. And uh, we have some other trimmings that will all arrive here in just a few minutes. And then we hope you'll stay and have lunch on us today and be our special guest. And many of our people have brought potluck. Now, if you've never had a potluck at the Oaks, oh man, are you missing something? You're going to have a encounter. In fact, you might believe that this meal might be a religious experience. It's that good. All right. So stick around, stay with us. I want to take you to the scriptures and I'm going to have to be really brief about it because we've got everything on schedule today and serving the meal. But Howard C. Rucker, Dr. Howard C. Rucker was a teacher of uh, theology at Yale Divinity School when that really used to mean something. He also happened to be a cartoonist and he often would draw pictures, cartoon pictures, and they would print these in some of their publications and he would uh, have, it was kind of his unique way of uh, expressing that uh, different matters to the church of biblical truth. One time he had a caption of a deep sea diver and he had that deep sea diver had uh, the, the wetsuit and he had the oxygen tank on his back. He had a mask on his face and he had flippers on his feet. When the very next caption, it shows this deep sea diver all dressed in his uh, suit with his mask on his face, oxygen tank on his back, flippers on his feet. And in the very next caption, it shows him starting to walk down the hallway with his suit on, his mask on his face, his oxygen tank on his back, and flippers on his feet. And in the very next caption, it shows him going into the bathroom, getting into a bathtub, and and praying with rubber ducks. And the caption was, this is the church that is not really on task. God has given us the Holy Spirit. He's equipped us with everything we ever need. And yet we're playing in the bathtub with toy boats. What he said is we need to go deeper and we need to go out further. And that's the truth in the, in the church, isn't it? I want to show you something from the scriptures today, if you would join me there. And I'm going to talk about overcoming a grasshopper mentality. I believe everybody can have one at times. And I want to take you to the book of Numbers, chapter 12 and also chapter 13. If you'll go there with me. I'll show you something from the 12, 12 spies that went over into the promised land. And I want you to see their reaction. Their reaction is incredible. They see what God has given to them in the promised land. So if you've got an outline, you can fill these in. If you uh, didn't get one, they're out in the foyer. You can grab one. They're also out here in the hallway. But I want to share with you about this problem of a grasshopper mentality in church. God equipped us to be powerful saints of his. In this Old Testament passage, I want you to notice, and I'm going to start in, in chapter 13, and I want you to look with me at the scriptures starting in verse 27. It says they gave Moses this account. So this is the report as they've come back. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. 
But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites uh, in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites uh, in the hill country, and the Canaanites live uh, near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone with him said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this word among the Israelites, a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are great of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from, ne from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. We look like grasshoppers to them. Doesn't matter that God's already promised that this land is yours. God's promised that you can possess this land. This is the holy land that God has given. You simply need to obey me and God will provide victory after victory after victory. But here they are looking at uh, what they shouldn't look at. Look at this and I want you to write down some things here as we look at this this morning. Look at the source Look at the source of where a grasshopper mentality comes from. What's the source? Well, instead of looking to the Lord and keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, which we're all commanded to do, that that's what helps us in our faith journey, here's what we're told. It, we're told that they started looking at the people groups that were there and how it was overwhelming. You know, if you look at DFW and you look at the seven point nine million people that are in our area and if you just go with the south 20 uh, i-20 corridor and those cities that are really more of our major field there's still some 2.2 2.4 million people that are easily within a 10 mile driving radius of our church and that's really probably our inner church field. And that's where most of our folks come from, as you know, from Duncanville and from Grand Prairie and from Mansfield and from Arlington. And uh, we probably extend out. We've got some from DeSoto and a few other places, but uh, there's usually not too many beyond that. We've got some that come all the way from Fort Worth. Did you know the Oaks is such a, a wonderful church that people would drive here from Fort Worth? Isn't that something? That is, isn't it? And other places as well. But look at the passage. If you go back to verse 33 and you look at the end of that verse, here's what's said. It says, we seemed like grasshoppers. Now, you know right now the grasshoppers as uh, summer is ending. Uh, are we praying that summer will end? I, I am. I'm tired of 105, 106, 107, 108, and I think we've got 109 coming today is what they say, right? I think there's a vent from hell that's opened up around here someplace. <laughs> they lacked sufficient faith. They really did. Look at this. It says, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we look the same to them. They're projecting on the groups that that's exactly that we're, we're inadequate for the task that we're called to. Do you know that's a lie out of the pit of hell right there? You are equipped by Almighty God. The Holy Spirit lives in you. We are equipped as a church to do whatever God asks us to do. And we know we're supposed to be, as you heard the prayer from Miguel earlier today, we, we know we're supposed to be gospel sharing, gospel praying, gospel everything, getting the news of Jesus Christ out there every way we can. Remember the, Jesus telling his disciples, he says, with man, it is impossible with God. Uh, all things are possible found in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. And that was just about an eye of a needle of going through that and how a camel might have to get down on 
is all fours and, and just there'd be a crawling or pulling them or pushing them through. Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans chapter 8, verse 31. The Lord told the Israelites back in the book of Exodus chapter 14, verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Isn't that an incredible word? Some of you need to hear that today because that's the truth. They lamented over a superficial foe. They really did. They were all upset. They said, the land, look, here's the fruit. Look how large. It's just like God said. It's like what we had prophesied to us. But they were lamenting over a superficial foe. If God is for you, who can be against you? And it's important to adopt that very mindset. Look at this. I'm going to read to you another little section of scripture. Go to verse 31 and notice what it says. It says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack these people. They're too strong for us. They're spreading among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said, this land devours those living in it. And the people we saw were of great size. The task here in DFW and our more centralized uh, South City corridor of I-20 here, that's kind of our primary field. Listen, the task is gigantic, but we have some sister churches to join us, don't we? We're not by ourselves. And listen, the Holy Spirit indwells us. He will guide us and he'll show us exactly what he wants done. You know, when I was in college, um, we were, uh, I was, uh, I had gone to Liberty University on a football scholarship, but it, I'm not the guy that you see now. I weigh 205 pounds now. I'm 63 years old. I'm an old dude and uh, got, got more than I should be carrying. But anyway, that's, and, and that's after a lot of weight loss. Well, in college, I was a defensive back. I ran back punts and kickoffs. And we used to have, I was a free safety on the, on the defense. Well, we had these drills with the other members uh, of the, the team. And one of them was called uh, Gut Check. And they would scream gut check and we knew we all had to leave our groups and come together and we would all be together and they would lay down a couple of those great big dummies, those great big uh, pads and they would line up a little section that was usually about five yards wide and it was usually about 20 yards long. And they would put us up against the different groups. Sometimes it was the defensive ends, sometimes it was the linebackers. And the one that we hated the most is when the defensive backs got assigned to go up against the, the tackles, the defensive tackles. And what would happen is we had this one guy, and occasionally we even did for him, but he was kind of like the fridge. If you can remember Chicago, the Chicago Bears, this, this young man, yeah, now people are cheering. Uh, we, you're in Dallas, by the way. Uh, just to remind you, Cowboys are coming. This is our year. <laughs> I just had to throw that in. Um, I'll just simply say this. We had our own guy. His name was Victor King. He was six foot three, 335 pounds. Besides being a very large man, he was, he was from Atlanta, Georgia. He was also very quick. Now, he wasn't fast, but boy, he could move quick. And man, he just, he would tackle people, tackle the quarterback, tackle running backs. Well, on this drill, you had to lay down helmet to helmet on your back. And then the coach would throw the football to one of you. Well, can you imagine? I weighed 165 pounds my first year. I finally got up to 180 pounds, but Victor would count out in the defensive backs, which one he was going to line up with in line. And he had nicknames for every one of us. He knew we were intimidated. We were a little scared of him because the first time he hit one of our, our guys, it was a guy, it was an all American uh, strong safety. They hit straight on and that strong safety bounced about 10 yards backwards, fell, fell on his back after Victor hit him. Well, he would get you and my name was uh, 
as you know, is Jude, but he, he, would, he would make up names, and they were derogatory names. He would say, hey, Judy! <laughs> I was Judy. In fact, every one of us had feminine names, you know. I, see, people were even confused back then, all those years ago. And he said, hey, Judy, I'm going to bust you up. And I knew if he hit me, he was going to bust me up. And so we finally started learning some moves that we could do with Victor. And one time, we just to play a joke, and the coaches thought it was funny, so we didn't have to run laps or anything. We decided that the entire group of defensive backs, when Victor jumped up, we were all, every one of us, were going to rush him and tackle him. And uh, I was in on that, and we, we did get him down. You couldn't bring the man down unless you just took his legs out. And a lot of times he just jump over top of you. But you know, there's things in life that we get intimidated by, don't we? You just feel like, I, I can't deal with this. I really can't. I wanna show you something and uh, <laughs> I never will remember. I still, even hear me say, hey Judy, <laughs> still shakes me uh, all these years later. Let's go to the second Reality, And here it is. There are shackles that come with a grasshopper mentality. Here it is. Look at chapter 14, and I want to show you a couple of verses, and here's what it says. It tells us that uh, there are shackles. There's things that just bind us. We're incarcerated by these things with that type of mentality. And it says it, it will always lead to burdens. Look at Numbers chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Now we're in the next chapter. And it says, that night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. So what, what report did they believe? The positive report or the negative report? They believed the 10, right? They believed the negative report. Listen to this, because it always leads to this. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Moses didn't even go over there, did he? But like leadership, they're catching some heat. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we would have died in Egypt or in the desert. If we had just stayed where we were and been slaves, it would have been better off. Well, you know that's garbage, right? But in our thinking, when we get down and we get intimidated in our walk in Christ and in our life as a church, we get in that type of frame of mind. God has equipped you with the Holy Spirit. Don't be like Elijah who was so depressed after a great victory that he's sitting there under that tree and he's so burdened because he hears that uh, Jezebel's coming after him or John the Baptist when he's in prison. Do you remember that? And uh, the Bible tells us that he was depressed. He even asked Jesus, are you the Holy One of God or should I look for another? See, depression and a wrong mindset can lead us to wrong conclusions, can it? We've got to watch that in our life. It also can lead to bondage. Look at this in verse 3 or 4. It says, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And there, uh, he said to each other, we should, have, we should choose another leader and go back to Egypt. They're ready to quit. Don't you quit. You don't know just what's around the corner. You may have negativity around you. You may have some things going on that are great challenges, but it's important that we don't go back to Egypt. It's kind of like that guy that his wife had passed and he's at the uh, graveside and he sees near his wife's uh, gravestone he sees over by there a stone that says, remember, friend, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So be prepared to follow me. Well, he found a piece of paper and he got a rock that was out there and he wrote this. He said, to follow you, I'm not content until I find out which way you went. Amen. 
See, we can learn from those that have gone before us, but if they drew wrong conclusions, you don't want to follow that, do you? And uh, just like he did, he wasn't content. Look at number three. Look at this, the solution to a grasshopper mentality. I got to wrap up, guys. We got stuff going on, more things going on. So I want you to look at this. It tells us that the 10, the 10 focused on the obstacles. Do you know that that's just so important in church life that we don't focus? We've got to be real. We've got to pray over the obstacles. But I want you to see a difference here in leadership. And here's what we need to do today as a church going forward. Check this out. Ten focused on the obstacles. It says in verse 24, chapter 14, But the men who had gone up with him said, we, or this is back in chapter 13, uh, We can't attack them. They're, they're stronger than we are. And they spread that among the Israelites because there were giants. These were descendants of the Nephilim. Oh man, we can't overcome these people. Well, the God that lives in you can have you do anything he calls you to do. And that's the facts, Jack. It really is. And I don't care if your name's not Jack, I'm talking to everybody. All right. Two of them focused on the opportunities. Two focused on the opportunities. See, it wasn't the majority on the 12 member committee that went over to the promised land that came back. It was 10 of them, the vast majority of them said, we can't do this. Two of them, you remember who they were? It was Caleb and it was who? Joshua. And they believed God could do something wonderful. Now I'm in Numbers 14. Look at verse 21. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and miraculous sign I performed in Egypt or in the desert are of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to my forefathers. See, if God's promised, it's a matter of staking your claim there. And we as a church, even in this Old Testament passage, can take that away. No one has treated me with contempt will ever see it, the Lord says. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he uh, went to and his descendants will inherit it. Ten focused on obstacles. Two focused on opportunities. Ten focused on the problems. Two focused on possibilities. The ten focused on their foes. But two focused on their faith in the Lord to do anything. Ten focused on their ability. But the two focused on the ability of God Almighty. And that is our task here today as, uh, as well. On July 4th, 1952, a lady attempted something amazing. She had already swimmed, swam the English Channel across and back as the first female. But in 52, she, her name, Florence Chadwick, waded into the waters off Catalina Island, just off about 26, seven miles off the coast of Los Angeles in California. She intended to swim that entire channel to the California coast, but the long distance swimmer was not able to do so. The reasons were simple. She swam for 14 hours and then gave up. There were sharks that were around that they were shooting at. She never, because of the fog bank that had covered Catalina all the way to the coast, she never ever could visually see with her eyes the California coastline. And that, she said, was the reason she finally just got out. Do you know when she got out, she was a half a mile she had already gone the distance of a marathon. A half a mile from the California coast, she said, I just couldn't see it. Big message here for us. Two months later, she gets into those waters. This day, there's no fog. And she makes it all the way to the California coast. And they said, what was the difference? She said, my vision of what I was after was right in front of me. I could see it with my eyes. There it is. 
Do you know that's the call of the church of Jesus Christ as well? That we need to follow the leadership of Jesus Christ. We need to be guided by the Holy Spirit and we need to be on mission for him. We have dared say that we're about loving God, loving people and living our mission. We need to be on mission. I am so thankful to celebrate today some accomplishments that God has done. Renovation team have been vehicles of being used of the Lord in that regard, but this is a work of God. Many of these things needed to be done a long time ago. Amen? So I want you to think about something. This morning we're so blessed, we really are, to have God just bless us. You know. One of the Bible verses that Miss Chadwick held on to was, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. I want you to think about something. We have giants, don't we? Our giants are many. We've got a huge mission field, but we've got other partners besides our church, right? And you look at, we need financial provision to see God do all that he does. We need to have growth in evangelism and prayer, full acceptance of our assignment as his witnesses. And we need, listen, what God put on my heart for the Oaks the year before I came here, when I was in process and and being a a candidate or candidating with the, the pastor search team, it's not changed. We need to be a revitalized church to go along with the renovations. Revitalize means that we all have revival. We have renewal. I harped about this and harped about it until you were like, man, can you preach on something else? I did that a lot. We really focused on prayer when we reopened the the prayer room. Listen, I want to tell you something. God's blessed us. So we have sold, we have sold 14.77 acres. That accomplished several things for us in our strategy of the future, in our vision. What did it do for us? One, it got us out of about $1.1 million of debt that was to the tune of about $170,000 in our budget every year that we're having to pay uh, on our interest and on our principal. And we were able to see that gone. That helped us immensely. And that helped us right after COVID had hit. Amen. Because we... uh, We got into the contract at the end of 2020, in December of 2020, and with all the things going on, we didn't close until April 30th of 2021. So we were in that that deal for a long time to get where we needed to. And you know all the hurdles and all the things we had to jump. We got out of debt, church. It's the first time that the First Baptist Church Oak Cliff or the Oaks Baptist Church has been out of debt for 43 years. Praise God. It changed everything, literally. Finances have gone down in churches all across our valley here in DFW, but it's that way across the country. There are things going on with, uh, that are just uh, uphill things for us to, to deal with. The decline in Christianity, the decline in churches. Uh, so we have to counter that because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. Uh, we know that the work of the Holy Spirit is still the same. What he's doing in the church is producing the fruit of the Spirit. He wants us to be guided by him, full of the Spirit, so that we can be... a uh, rejuvenated, uh, revitalized, a revived people of God. And God is calling us to do just that. And it's about us as leaders and all of the church saying, Lord, we want to have a fresh new anointing and work on our own lives here. It comes through prayer. It comes through confession of sin. It comes by really aligning our hearts where they need to be. And I want to share with you, I believe, and I just want to share this as just some vision from your pastor today. I think you should get this. God blessed us, and we have seen almost $500,000 in renovation. You look around, and you can take the tour with the renovation folks, and we'll help out too if we need to But during lunch. But we want to show you all that God has done physically. But I'm more concerned as the pastor of the church about having rejuvenated hearts, 
having revived, a revived body, because this is the place we meet, but God lives in here, doesn't he? The Holy Spirit indwells us as his temple. And I do believe that God, listen, we, we, we have given to date $523,700 to mission causes, to, to $350,000 to Southern Baptist mission causes as a gift out of those proceeds besides getting the debt paid off. And now we're at this renovation point still with three or four big projects to go. And so we're probably going to have to give them some more money to operate on. You hear me, church? We're going to have to give them a little bit more money to operate on because we, and we'll be coming back to you for that. But I believe that in the day in which we live, let me tell you what's on my heart more than anything. I want to show you something as a visual image. What do we do with that nearly $3 million that's sitting over in the bank? that we use for the future. Well, obviously we've blessed some ministries. We've blessed some, we've blessed uh, getting, getting ourselves out of debt. And then these renovations, listen, can you imagine if the air conditioned system was like it was last summer? <laughs> Attendance would have been 10 people. That's probably it. I mean, seriously. All the air conditioners have all been replaced. I mean, you'll see a sheet out there. Pick one up. It has a list of all the things that the renovation team has been working. And some of those are things we were working on a little bit prior to the renovation team. But I believe that in this day where we are fighting against a satanic Marxist culture, I kid you not, that's what's going on. We are swimming upstream. There are those that are part of the elite community and it may go all the way to where it's, it's, it's core in Washington, DC. Just gonna say it. Let me just be truthful with you. If we're really serious about evangelizing and discipling and ministering and worship and fellowship, our five principles that we're all about in the great commandment and the great commission. If we are really, I believe God may be leading us to do this. Let me show you a picture. Oh, wow. Well, that doesn't really match our building. I just like that one. I told Tiffany, I said, keep that one. That probably looks a little more like our facilities, only we have a green, green metal roof, right? Or maybe this. Now, the reason I throw that out is I believe God may be calling us, and I'm just speaking this word to you. He may be calling us to get into the school ministry, to open up our academy. One of the things we're working on, and you'll see, uh, I don't know if they've got pictures down the hall or not. Jerry, I don't know if you all got those done, but we're gonna redo the entire playground so that we can reopen the preschool academy. Now, we haven't been able to have, because we don't have an industrial kitchen and other issues that we have to qualify, we don't have a preschool where we can meet every day and it has to be a certain amount of hours. And we partnered with some other churches and we did two days a week and Matthew Road did two days a week and The Woods did two days a week. And there was just a, a combination of efforts to do that. But as we open up the academy again, wouldn't it be great if we could have a weekday preschool every day that's here every day that we have an industrial kitchen see if we took that other and we'd have to build probably a metal building maybe with a face like some of these that you saw up here and this I'm not an architect I just I just picked these out the other day and said throw those up there and put Oaks Academy on it well it's not just the Oaks Academy as preschool but it's the Oaks Academy that would be kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and perhaps God might even expand that vision to be middle school. Listen, our kids are dealing with every kind of polluted idea. It's not just, it's not just our liberal arts colleges where the battleground is now. It's now they've gone after our kids in high school and all the way down to little kids in, 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 uh, in where they're being presented ungodly 
being robbed of their innocence. And I'm telling you, the church that's serious, and I believe all along, and I've already, there's been several things we've done to try to build the Oaks into a younger church. So I'm not talking about me. I'm 63. I'll have my time here and then I will not. I will be over. But what will the church be like in the future? I believe we've got to do things that will keep making the church younger and younger. We've already approached that from a staff angle. But we need to approach that now from what would help the church to become younger and younger. Well, you've made it 133 years. We have made it, Ronnie, 133 years. That's a long haul for a church, isn't it? But I believe God's got more for us. And in the days ahead, our evangelism and disciple and ministry strategy may very well in include that we have a school. Why? Well, God gave us this money to get out of debt, right? Renovations and to bless the kingdom in doing some mission. We just call it the Oaks. Uh, we call it the Oaks Kingdom Gifts. That 500, we're going to give, uh, we still have about 51,000 to give away that hopefully this year we'll, we'll finish that. But I wanted to share with you and go back. I think that's the ugliest building, okay? Yeah. Now, Pastor, I like that one. All right. But to have a two story, have a, have a gym with a two story wraparound for education with an industrial kitchen in it, we could do numerous things. We already have a building that could be used for a school. Many times this type of construction lends itself to a school. Why in the world do we need to do this? Because they're stealing our children. I kid you not. And if you think the church is having difficult days now, you just wait another 10 or 20 years. I believe that God may be putting, it's in my heart, and there's lots and lots of prayer and lots and lots of work to do if God leads us. But is that three million remaining for a school? Kind of a metal structure that has maybe a nice face on it, blends in with our buildings. I believe, and I wanted to use this day to talk about our renovations and the future. I believe God may be calling us to do just that together. Pray with me about this. Today's just an introduction day, all right? But pray with me about this. To really be serious about evangelizing is going to have to help families with the entire family structure. And one of their biggest issues is schools. Do you know that there's really not a school on this I-20 corridor? until you get really, I mean, uh, Matthew Road does kind of a hybrid with a homeschool, but you, you have to go all the way to Grace Prep before you get to, and that's a little bit of a hybrid. The need is great. The population would definitely support it. Would it bring people to our church? And listen, people that have kids are what? Young. How does the church keep going on? Because it has times that God births a whole new generation of the church. It's part of my heart. I hope it becomes part of our strategy.